come to order. Uh, at the start of the uh, hearing, I'd like to uh, recognize Annette Lantos, the uh, widow of uh, uh, former Congressman uh, Tom Lantos, who uh, participated along with her family members in the, the inauguration of the, uh, of the Tom Lantos uh, Institute in their native Hungary. And uh, it will be undoubtedly the premier human rights uh, institute in the world. So we, we always welcome you back, Annette. Thank you for being with us. And I'm sorry I could not uh, uh, be on that trip to, uh, to participate in such a momentous occasion. And also at the start of the hearing, I'd like to capitalize on the presence of uh, uh, a range of State Department personnel and remind the department of this committee's longstanding uh, pending request for the Secretary of State to testify on Afghanistan and Pakistan at the end of this month, we hope, and immediately upon full Senate confirmation, uh, <clears throat> Deputy Secretary of State Bill Burns, and we would like to have testify on uh, Iran and Syria. And we had requested Ambassador Burns when he was still Under Secretary of State and had just been nominated for the uh, Deputy Secret uh, Secretary post. After recognizing myself and the ranking member, my friend Mr. Berman, for seven minutes each for our opening statements, I will recognize each member of the committee for one minute for uh, their opening remarks. We will then hear from our witnesses, and I would ask that you uh, summarize your prepared statements in five minutes each before we move to the questions and answers uh, with members under the five-minute rule. Without objection, the witnesses' prepared statements will be made a part of the record, and members may have five days to insert statements and questions for the record subject to length limitations in the rules. Uh, the chair now recognizes herself for seven minutes. The Obama administration uh, came into office intending to reset the U.S.-Russia relationship. Their assumption was that the Bush administration had needlessly, needlessly antagonized Moscow with overly aggressive policies and that a more conciliatory approach would produce Russian cooperation in a broad range of issues. To that end, the Obama administration has offered one concession after another, but the concrete results have been meager at best. Russian cooperation on Iran is usually cited as a major accomplishment. But other than agreeing not to block UN Security Council Resolution 1929, which Moscow insisted it be watered down, Russia's approach to Iran remains essentially unchanged, even as Iran accelerates its march toward a nuclear weapons capacity. So Russia is also committed to stopping U.S. missile defense efforts. The Obama administration has said that the recently ratified Strategic Arms Control Treaty, known as the New START, places no restrictions on U.S. missile defense efforts. However, the Russian government has repeatedly stated that the treaty does, in fact, come with such restrictions and has unambiguously stated that it will not honor the terms of the agreement if the U.S. proceeds with its plans. Russia claims that U.S. missile defense efforts in Europe is a threat to their security, and we know that those claims are absurd on their face. Independent experts say that not only does the proposed system uh, pose no threat, but that it cannot do so, a fact that Russia le Russia's uh, leadership is well aware of. Russia's true motive is a political one, namely to divide NATO and to demonstrate to the countries of Central and Eastern Europe that Despite their close alliance with the U.S., Moscow intends to retain a dominant influence over their affairs. This is how the government and people in that region see it. Putin's government claims a privileged position for Russia regarding the countries on or near its borders and has repeatedly used its muscle to enforce this assertion of rights. Moscow has exploited their dependence on Russian energy supplies, including oil, natural gas, and electricity to pressure governments to accommodate Russian demands, going so far as to cut off supplies in the middle of winter. When Estonia defied the demands of Russian officials not to relocate a Soviet memorial in its capital, a massive cyber attack was launched on that country, almost paralyzing it. Worst of all, in 2008, Russia's long-standing efforts to reimpose its control over Georgia moved beyond uh, sowing political and economic turmoil and promoting separatist, uh, separatist movement to, 
an all-out invasion of large parts of that American ally. The tepid U.S. response has set a dangerous precedent and convinced Moscow that it has little to worry about. Moscow's actions have demonstrated the lengths that it is prepared to take to assert its influence on an even larger scale, a fact that is especially troubling in light of Europe's growing dependence on Russian energy. There are many other areas in which Russia still targets U.S. interests, such as its arms sales to the Chavez regime in Venezuela, but the list is too long to go into here. So it appears that the benefits for the U.S. of the reset are few and far between, but we have paid a high price for them. Last year's nuclear cooperation agreement with Russia was a gift pure and simple. The U.S. market was open to Russian nuclear companies, but U.S. companies will find no corresponding opportunities in that country where they will be shut out by its state-owned nuclear monopolies. Russia did receive the U.S. seal of approval for its efforts to become the world's one-stop shop for all things nuclear. This reward was given even as Russia was continuing to assist Iran in its nuclear program. The latest offer to Moscow is support for Russia's entry into the World Trade Organization. This despite Russia's continuing refusal to clamp down on the massive piracy of American intellectual property, which is second in scale only to China's and much of which occurs on state-owned property. It also comes as the Russian government's abuse of human rights and brutal approach toward those seeking a truly democratic government in Russia have only worsened. After the Russian authorities broke up opposition uh, protests in Moscow and St. Petersburg late last year, detaining scores of activists, Russia's Vladimir Putin stated, quote, if the protesters demonstrate without permission, they'll take a cudgel to the head. That's all there is to it, end quote. This disturbing statement underscores the brutal nature of the Russian government and its abusive treatment of anyone who challenges its policies. There has been a particularly shameful pattern of beatings and murders of journalists in Russia, and no one has been held accountable. And yet in another effort to prevent the democratic opposition from participating in the upcoming parliamentary elections, the Kremlin has banned Boris Nemtsov, one of Russia's most prominent democratic leaders whom I met with last year, from leaving Russia again should he return from his current visit to France. What have we bought for all of our concessions to Moscow? How many times do we have to relearn the painful lesson that aggressors cannot be bought off, that allies must not be abandoned, that naively trusting our adversaries to do anything other than pursue their own interests will produce no other outcome than to needlessly sacrifice our interests and undermine our security. It is my hope that the administration will reconsider its approach to the Russian regime, and I now turn to my good friend, the distinguished ranking member, for his opening remarks.